Hello and welcome to IBD Edinburgh 2022, Holistic Remission from Bench to Bedside. My name is Charlie Lees and it gives me a huge pleasure to welcome my expert faculty to you, our audience, for this virtual event. I'm a gastroenterologist in Edinburgh. I'm delighted to have put on this event that I've co-created with Tim Rain and Elsa Hart. I'm going to kick things straight off now by tackling some of the big questions in IBD today. What causes IBD? What are the consequences of IBD? And what are the general principles of treatment that we should take with us today? First, let me share with you my disclosures. IBD consists of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. These are common conditions that affect nearly one in 100 people today. The precise cause remains unknown, but we know that we have a dysregulated mucosal immune response, an altered microbiome or a dysbiosis, and we have key environmental and genetic drivers. IBD is classically relapsing and remitting. It progresses over time if we are not careful, and there is a need in most patients for medical therapy and all too frequently for surgical therapy too. There are many unanswered questions and an urgent unmet clinical need. For an individual patient who develops IBD, hopefully we induce remission, but all too commonly the disease flares and there is progression of disease over time. For an individual, this means gut symptoms, diarrhea, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting. It means psychosocial symptoms and the impact on an individual's life. It means impact on energy levels, sleep. It means impact on everyday life activities. We also see extra intestinal manifestations affecting the joints, mouth, skin, eyes, and liver. And we all too commonly see the evolution of disease with hospitalizations, surgery, further complications, including complications of our therapies. So how common is IBD today? Well, let's go back a minute and remind ourselves that in the first half of the 20th century, IBD was relatively uncommon. We saw it in Northern America and Western Europe. But what's happened as the world has changed, as environmental drivers have shifted, as the world has moved towards adopting a Western lifestyle, we have seen this emergence of IBD across the planet. In Edinburgh, if we dive into more detail of the work that Gareth Jones put together, we now know that as of 2018, the prevalence was 0.78%. In other words, one in every 125 people living with IBD. People are typically diagnosed young, teenagers, 20s, 30s, young adulthood, but IBD can occur at any age. But because IBD is lifelong and incurable, and because the instance has gone up in the last 50 years, we are seeing this compound prevalence, which means that our patients are getting older. And so whilst incidence is stable in the Western world, we see the prevalence going up. Within a decade, it will be over 1%, and more of these people will be older with comorbidities. We will need to factor that in. So with these changes across the world in the last 50 years, mirroring this increase in IBD, we can start to think more carefully about what causes inflammatory bowel disease. This triad of genes, environment, and the microbiome seems to be essential. Our environment is very different from our ancestors. We share much of our DNA with our primate and our early hominid ancestors, but our environments have shifted beyond all recognition. And within this, we see now IBD in modern man that was very uncommon in ancient hominids, although not entirely non-existent. So what are these environmental drivers? Well, certainly diet looks to be absolutely key. Others, including industrial pollution, food additives, hygiene, antibiotics, smoking and surgery and stress, vitamin D and sunlight, ge geography and travel, all perhaps play a role in IBD onset and its consequences. Diet fascinates me and many of us enormously, both in terms of how it affects the gut in normal life, 
but it really does seem to be an important factor in a Crohn's disease and in ulcerative colitis, and we will dive into the factors here in more detail. Some elements have been put together through the piece. So if you look at high fat diet, you look at host factors like a bile acid, you look at the microbiome and genetic factors, you can start to see how these things all piece together. Dietary emulsifiers have been shown to play a key role in animal models. And we're looking with, I think, great interest to see how that will translate into IBD in humans. So that's a bit about environmental drivers. That's a bit about diet. What about genetics? Well, my research background in IBD really came from genetics, where we've gone from early linkage studies to genome-wide association studies, meta-analyses of these studies, big immunochip studies, and now in this whole genome sequencing era where we're starting to put together tens and tens of thousands of IBD genomes and healthy controls. What we already know is that there are well over 300 independent susceptibility loci associated with IBD, and these start to co-locate with biological pathways that seem to be highly relevant, that are translated, many of them, through animal models, and where we can see significant overlap in the clinic today. Jack stat signaling, IL-12, IL-23 signaling, in particular, integrin signaling, all with significant gene hits. Many new therapies are likely to come from gene discoveries and biological understanding of that today. The microbiome is certainly of central importance. It seems very likely that our environment is shaping our microbiome, that that is manipulated against this genetic background, and that that's driving, in part at least, the dysregulated mucosal response where we see these hallmarks of patients with Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis today. Many different factors here. What does this give us? It gives us highly heterogeneous phenotypes. What does that mean? It means that no two patients are the same. So for me and you as clinicians, this provides the challenge, but also the pleasure of looking after our patients in the clinic. But it is something we have to recognize when we start to think about precision medicine. Our challenges are many, not least that treatment failure and disease progression is common. So whilst disease relapse and remits with symptoms and periods of remission, we see in the backdrop, particularly in Crohn's disease, the disease progressing with evolution of progressive bowel damage, stricturas, fistulas, surgery, stomas, this accumulation of irreversible changes, which is why early aggressive therapy is so important for many. All too commonly, patients will need surgery, not necessarily a failure of therapy. For many patients, this is a good option. But actually, overall, we would like to reduce our surgical rates and do it when we do it in a more planned way and not because the disease has escaped our control. Through all of this, we have the challenge that we lack good predictive models. This is the case in determining who will get IBD. It's in the case in terms of who will have active uh, quiescent or active aggressive disease and those who will flare and those who will develop progression and complications of disease and therapy. So at diagnosis, two patients can look the same. One will have a relatively quiescent disease course and population-based studies suggest this is about one third of all patients. But most patients, the majority, will have this relapsing remitting and progression of disease over time. Ideally, what we want to do at diagnosis is identify prognostic factors for risk and to be able to stratify our patients by biology to treat with the right drug for the right patient at the right time. But we are not brilliant at either of these bits yet. It's important in Crohn's disease to acknowledge that the disease progresses. Most patients start with purely inflammatory disease. Over time, as you see on this chart here from the International Consortium, you see more penetrating and more stricturing complications as things progress with time. Now, this we've known for a long time. We've known that if we treat earlier, we do things rather better. Until recently, we've not had the widespread availability of effective agents. Why widespread? Well, because 
therapy agents need to be available. They also need to be cost effective. So we are now firmly in this area of biosimilar anti-TNF therapy, where drug therapy can cost as little as 1,500 to 2,000 pounds per year. But we also have new agents that tackle different pathways, and we have a very rich therapeutic pipeline available coming now. So, early effective therapy in Crohn's disease appears to be a really core treatment principle. We see this from our Edinburgh data that Phil Jenkinson generated, showing that when you treat earlier with Crohn's disease with biologics, as we have done in the right-hand graph here, you get lower surgical rates and a longer time to first operation. This is mirrored if you look at all the phase three randomized studies where you can see this clear trend in the left. Earlier treatment in Crohn's disease makes a much bigger difference. That pattern is not there in UC and probably in UC, the important thing is to recognize that when the disease flares, that's when the clock starts ticking. And we now have many agents that we can use to treat ulcerative colitis, not just mesalazines, but also anti-TNF agents, anti-integrin agents, uh, IL-12 therapy, and JAK inhibitors with more to come as well. This change happened in about 2014-15. And if you look at colectomy rates in Lothian, where Edinburgh is, you can see how they have dropped off after 2014-15. We have seen fewer colectomies when we've been using more biologics. This is a better result for our patients today. OK, so we want our patients to be well. If we're not yet preventing IBD today, what we would like to do is get our patients into deep remission and keep them there. Stratification by risk is something we will cover a bit later. Treatment by biology I will cover briefly, as well as preventing disease from flaring. So the core of our precision medicine approach ideally is getting the right drug to the right patient at the right time. Some of that's precision medicine, some of that's head-to-head -head studies, and it's going to be very interesting to me to see how those two feed in together over the next couple of years. This will inform drug sequencing. We will see the various role of antibodies versus small molecules, and we will soon be starting to combine therapies in earnest. What about preventing the disease from flaring? I've been running the PREDICT study in Edinburgh for a number of years now, and this year we will be very excited to see the first meaningful results coming from this. Trying to determine which aspects of baseline habitual diet, the environment, genetics, and the microbiome are associated with and predict disease flare in IBD patients in remission. So we are taking a large cohort, 2,500 patients in remission. We're doing a deep dive to look at their clinical features, their the microbiome, their DNA, their diet habits, as well as psychosocial function. And then we're following over time to see what happens in those that flare versus those that do not. This longitudinal follow-up is critical. These and other studies are going to start to help us get much closer to success. Success for our patients and for our system, whereby we have fewer patients having fewer complications and we have better outcomes over time. So here we are. This is where we end up, where currently we're not very good at stratifying by risk or treating by biology. But we have got very good now at monitoring with treat-to-target algorithms, which we'll explore in much more detail, that enable us to catch up quickly when things are not going the way we want to for our patients today. So here we are, 2022. I think we are looking towards a horizon with huge possibilities for inflammatory bowel disease. Seven or eight new molecules should come to the market for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis within the next two or three years, a few of them already this year. There are more phase three RCT data for new exciting molecules coming. We're seeing the application now of multiple omics on huge cohorts of patients with longitudinal follow-ups. We've got diet studies. We've got other interventions. I think we are understanding now how to treat our patients as a whole, looking at holistic care, and we are looking at digital solutions that will soon bring in artificial intelligence and machine learning so that we have truly predictive analytics to help our patients get better over time. 
Thank you for taking the time to listen to me just now. I want to acknowledge my team who have done an enormous power of work over the last years to help bring us to this point and who've been instrumental in helping setting up this meeting today. I want to wish you all a very happy, successful conference and thank you very much for your attention today.